Good morning. And a very warm welcome to all, to those of you here in the church and everyone watching online. And as a very special welcome to some boys and girls here this morning, the jam and flashlight resumed today and it's great, although it'll only be for the month of June, it's great we've got the children with us. I know there is no need, you know there's no need to book a seat now, but if you wish to sit downstairs, could you please contact Sheila Innes either by email or telephone by Friday at lunchtime. And the next North Grouping prayer meeting will be held a week tomorrow. It's Monday the 14th of June at 6.30 p.m. The ID and password are printed in the Extraordinary Times. Sad news is that Jim McClurg, who used to be a church officer in this church, passed away on Wednesday evening. The funeral service is still to be arranged. But we'll be remembering his wife Eileen and his daughters Valerie and Denise and the wider family in our prayers. And we're also sorry to have to announce that Rebecca Broughton, better known to as Rebecca Penman, sadly died on Tuesday the 1st of June. She was only 26 years of age. I'm sure you wish to remember her husband Barry and her two little sons in your prayers. The funeral service will be on Wednesday the 9th of June in Dunlop Church. And late on Friday afternoon, I had a letter from Air Presbytery, and the following is a short statement from it, and I will explain more two weeks today when I conduct worship <coughs> on that Sunday. I'm sorry, this is not good news. The General Assembly suspended all presbytery plans from the 1st of June 2021. Air Presbytery have to have a new plan in place by June 2022. The General Assembly have agreed that in future there will be 600 minister posts and 60 vacancies nationally. Air Presbytery is going to meet on the 10th of August to discuss this new plan and to allocate ministry in a reduced number of charges, that's a reduced number of churches. Air Presbytery has been allocated 19 ministers, and at present there are 32. There are 19 posts with 19 ministers in post with 13 vacancies. There will therefore have to be many readjustments made. All of this means that no vacant church will be allowed to call a minister until the Presbytery plan is in place in June 2022. This affects not only Newton Wallerstown and all the churches in Air Presbytery, but every church throughout the Church of Scotland. I realise this is not news you were wanting to hear, and it's difficult to take it all in. I will obviously continue as your interim moderator and locum, and as I said two weeks today on the 20th of June, I will explain more when I conduct worship. Obviously, I don't know what's going to happen, but I do believe that Newton Wallace Town Church in some form will exist in the future. I'm sure you're all stunned to hear that, and I'm sorry it's all got, but it had to be said today. The service was prepared before I knew that news, but I will reflect the news in the service two weeks today. Our call to worship this morning, Jesus said, whoops, <clears throat> Jesus said, where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. And we now hear the hymn, As the Deer Pants for the Water.
now let us draw near to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we praise you that you're able to do much more than we can ever ask or imagine. When we can do so little, you can do so much. When we can do nothing, you can do everything. When life feels good and the days ahead are full of promise, our worries few, our joys many, we praise you, Lord, that you're able to offer us still more. When the future seems dark and frightening, when our problems seem unsurmountable and our resources too few, we praise you, Lord, that you're able to see us through. Help us to know that whatever happens, whether good or bad, you are able to do far more than we can ever imagine. Loving Father, we have to ask you to forgive us. So often we fail to appreciate everything that you have given. Forgive us that we take the beauty of the world around us for granted, and so often we forget about your unfailing love. Forgive us that too often we're more concerned about the negative instead of the positive, and we forget that you are in control. Loving God, help us and guide us by your Holy Spirit so that we are better followers of Jesus Christ our Lord. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now Pauline is coming to speak to the boys and girls and everyone. Hi, boys and girls. Nice to see you. We've got Ben. I can see Carolyn. I can see Tess. Amazing to see you. Oh, hello. Fiona and Ian's here as well. You must have sneaked in. I was looking for you coming. So good to see you all. Anyway. I wonder if any of you have at home something called a kaleidoscope. No, you maybe don't know what that is. Oh, good. I was going to say, I bet you a lot of the grown-ups know what that is. You used to have one, yeah. Those days, that's all the, all the toys we had, wasn't it, Rona? I remember. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it kind of looks a little bit like a telescope, and you put it up to your eye, and you can turn it around, and you see lots of lovely colours. Now, I didn't have one to bring to you today, but we have a video of what it might look like. So if you can see one of the screens, either that big one or that one up there, then you can see. Look at all the pretty colors and they just keep changing all the time. You never get the same one again. Now, don't look at it too closely. You get mesmerized and you fall asleep. <laughs> it's pretty, isn't it? nice. If you see one of those toys in the shop, maybe you can get one because they're very good. They're very good. I remember having one when I was young and I would spend hours and hours just looking at it and seeing all the beautiful colours. And sometimes you would see one of the designs and you would just want to save it. But even if you just moved the kaleidoscope a little bit, it would change into something else and you would never see that one again. Now, our world can sometimes be like that. Our world is constantly changing, just like the kaleidoscope was there. People change because all of you look so much older than the last time I saw you. And I wonder if we maybe look older too, probably, a wee bit. The seasons change. We're getting into summer now, so hopefully we're going to get more sunny days in the next few months, although that's not always guaranteed, is it? And we've had lots of changes in the past maybe a year and three months or, or maybe a wee bit longer. Remember, we weren't able to come to church. And then we could. But then we couldn't again. And now we can again. And now we can have Sunday school again. That's brilliant, isn't it? And a year and a half ago, remember you could go to a shop and not have to put a mask on. That was good. Or even come to church and not have to put a mask on. And now all you see in the shops or in the church it's just people's eyes like that, isn't it? It's weird. And you guys had online remote learning at home, remember? Where instead of going into school and instead of seeing your friends. And now you can go into your classroom. And nothing ever seems to stay the same. It's a world that's constantly changing. And now we don't know what's going to happen in the future for anything, do we? But God knows, which is always a good thing. 
it's always good to have something to count on, something that we know is never going to change, especially in this world today. And we know that there is something that never changes. And it tells you in the Bible, in a book called Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 8, it says this, and you can see this on the screen too. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. He's the same today, and he is going to be the same forever, even in years and years to come. Even if we're living in space, Jesus Christ will always be the same. So when everything around us is changing and we don't know what to believe or what to think, we can always know that Jesus will remain the same and his love for us remains the same and his truth for us remains the same. And that is one thing that we can always, always count on. Don't you think we should say a little prayer now? Yeah? Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your love that never changes. We are so thankful that we can count on you to remain the same when everything around us is changing. Amen. And now the boys and girls are going to leave and go through to Sunday school. great to see the children here once again. And now let us hear the word of God and the passage of bread this morning by John Hay. Sir. Our Bible reading this morning is from the Gospel according to Mark, at chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. In this modern translation, <clears throat> the chapter is headed, Jesus Heals a Paralytic. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralytic man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this reading from his holy word. Thank you. Thank you, John. And now we're going to hear the praise band as they sing the hymn, There is Power in the Name of Jesus. <laughs>
title for our sermon this morning is Who is Jesus? Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Who is Jesus? I wonder how you would answer that question. In the passage that we heard this morning, the healing of the paralytic or the paralyzed man, Jesus was answering that question. Here too we see the opposition from the beginning of the religious leaders of the day. Who was he they were thinking to themselves? It was through the healing of the paralyzed man that Jesus tried to show them. This in itself was unique because after the other healings in Mark's gospel, Jesus warned the person not to say anything about it as it was not yet time for him to reveal that he was the Messiah. So this morning, let us think about the details of this miracle, the last of the three in the first beginning of Mark's gospel. In the first one, Jesus drives out an evil spirit, and in the second, he touches and heals a man with leprosy. So this is also a story about a healing. And in the first verse, we're told that Jesus again entered Capernaum, and it was from Capernaum that Jesus began his ministry. The people flocked to hear him. He was preaching in a house, it was probably Peter's house, and it was so crowded that the people had to stand outside. Four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They saw how crowded the house was, so they climbed up onto the roof. A commentator says that the roof of a Palestinian house was flat. I quote, It was used regularly as a place of rest and quiet, so usually there was an outside stair attached to it. The roof consisted of flat beams laid across from wall to wall, perhaps about three feet across. The space between the beams was filled with brushwood packed tightly with clay. It would therefore be very easy for the men to dig out the clay and the branches between the beams and then let their friend down to Jesus. As we heard at verse 5, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus knew what was in this man's heart and so he assures him of God's forgiveness. We do not know what the sins are, but Jesus knew that the man needed spiritual healing before or as well as physical healing. This is one of the stories that we know very well. Many of us remember it from our own Sunday school days. And usually we think about the great faith of the four men, but who did these men think that Jesus was? They knew that Jesus had the power to heal their friend, they knew that he healed people, and so their belief was so strong that nothing was going to stop them bringing their friend to Jesus. And for many people today, this is who Jesus is. He's able to heal. He is the one who has the power to heal them of whatever illness they have. There are people who believe that Jesus can heal cancer, put their broken marriage back together, and heal a young person who's been taking drugs. Jesus can do all these things, but immediately we have the question, what about the people who are not healed? There are no easy answers to that question, and it would take a whole sermon to try to or attempt to answer it. Secondly, in this passage, the teachers of the law who were present accused Jesus of blasphemy, of showing disrespect to God. As we heard, the first thing that Jesus did was to forgive the man's sins. On this occasion, Jesus did not directly heal him of his paralysis. Instead, he told him his sins were forgiven. And this is what got Jesus into trouble. The teachers of the law accused him of blasphemy. He was assuming for himself the authority that only belonged to God. 
The teachers of the law sincerely believed that only God could forgive sin and only after a sinner repented. And the penalty for blasphemy was death by stoning. No doubt they were thinking to themselves, who does Jesus think he is? Is he God himself? Throughout the history of the Christian church, this has been a central affirmation. God was in Jesus Christ. God was acting in what Jesus said and what he did. And there have always been those who do not believe this. They admire Jesus as a great teacher who had great wisdom. Others have seen him as a moral example of how to live courageously in the face of evil. Others consider him to be a great prophet, reminding them of what God wanted them to do and to be. But to think of Jesus as God himself come down to earth, no way. Who does he think he is? Is he God himself? And this is a question that we all have to face. Who is Jesus? And thirdly, we think of the outcome of the story, which is wholeness. Jesus knew what the teachers of the law were thinking, and he had an answer for them. We heard at verse 8 that Jesus said, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat, and walk. To the Jews, a sick man was one with whom God was angry. It's still true that there are some illnesses that are due to sin. Other times, the illness can be due to something a person has inherited or contracted due to the sins of others. There are illnesses that can happen because a mother has taken drugs, for example. Jews, therefore, would have agreed that the forgiveness of sins had to happen before the person was healed. It's possible that in this story, Jesus is really saying to the man, Son, God is not angry with you, and so he is healed. As we heard, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, take up your mat and go home. The man got up, took up his mat and walked out. In verse 10, Jesus refers to himself as the son of man. This is the first time this phrase is used in Mark's gospel. In Daniel chapter 7 at verse 13 are the words, in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. The son of man was a messianic figure who would come one day to, to judge and to forgive sins. And Jesus is saying that he is that person. As I said at that time, the people believed that no one could be healed physically until their sins had been forgiven. Because this man was healed, his sins must have been forgiven. But it is only God who can forgive. And because Jesus forgave this man's sins, the only logical conclusion was that Jesus was God. This is what Jesus wanted the people to understand. At verse 12, we read or heard that the people were amazed and praised God, saying they'd never seen anything like this before. But still, the religious leaders did not understand. They would not believe that Jesus was God. Jesus had clearly shown them, but it did not change their thinking. In this incident, Jesus signed his own death warrant, and he knew it. In the whole of Jesus' life, we can see how God feels about us. And this is the very opposite of the way the people thought at that time. They believed that God was very strict in the way that he judged. They thought of God in the terms of continual demand. But God was longing to love and to forgive. In one of his essays, Lewis Hind writes about the day he discovered who his father really was. 
He always respected and admired his father, but he had also been a little afraid of him. One Sunday, he went to church with his father. It was a hot, sultry day, and he grew sleepier and sleepier. He couldn't keep his eyes open, and his head nodded. Then he saw his father's arm go up, and he was sure he was father going to shake him or even hit him. And he looked up, and he saw his father was gently smiling at him. Then his arm went round his shoulders, and he cuddled the boy to himself so he could rest more comfortably. That day, Lewis discovered that his father was not the person he had thought him to be. He realized that his father loved him. And this is what Jesus did. He showed by his actions just <clears throat> how much God is willing to forgive and how much he loves each and every one of us. Who do we think that Jesus is? Do we think that Jesus is God? This is what Scripture teaches. When we see Jesus, we see God. Jesus forgives sin because God forgives sin. Jesus loves because God loves. All that we need to know is revealed in Jesus. All that we need to know about God is seen in Jesus. When we urge others to put their trust in Jesus, we're bringing them into the saving arms of God. Jesus may or may not heal our physical illnesses, but Jesus can heal our spiritual sickness. Our sins are forgiven, our lives are made whole, and we are part of the kingdom of God forever. If we're honest with ourselves and imagine that we're standing in that crowded room in Capernaum, would we be like the teachers of the law, not wanting to acknowledge our need of Jesus, not wanting to believe that Jesus can forgive sin? Or we, would we be like the paralyzed man in the crowd and be amazed and thankful for all that we have seen? How do you see Jesus? It's only when we welcome Jesus as God that we really see the salvation that is offered to us. Jesus wants us to open our hearts and commit our lives to him. Amen. And now we listen to a piece of music for a short time of reflection, and there'll be some pictures on the screen. I think the pictures on the screen are for those watching online. Let us pray. 
Living God, we thank you for the promise that when we come together in the name of Jesus, he is here amongst us. He is present as we share in fellowship in the church, and he is with us as we worship in our own homes. He is present in the scriptures, constantly speaking to us in new ways. He is present in the world around us, in the beauty of creation, and in the people we meet. Living God, we thank you that whoever we are, wherever we are, whatever we are doing, you are with us through Jesus Christ. You are leading us forward, guiding us in everything we do. Loving God, we pray now for all those who are denied access to the things we take for granted. Food and clothing, education, a home in which to live, human rights and freedom of speech and justice. Lord of all, we pray now for those whose lives and work offers us the care, the security and the opportunities that we take for granted in our own society. We pray for those who work in all our local hospitals, in the hospice and in all our care homes. We pray too for those who work in the emergency services and also in social and community work, although they've had to communicate by telephone over so many months. And loving God, we pray now for all those who are suffering at the present time. We bring before you Eileen McClurg and Jim's daughters, Valerie and Denise. And we pray for Rebecca's husband, Barry, our two little children, and all the wider family. Bless to you, Lord God, others who've been bereaved, those who have a sore heart at this time. In a few moments of silence, let us pray for those uppermost in our hearts this morning. Bless each one, Lord God. And may we all bear one another's burdens with courage and love. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I've been hoping to say that if we were going on to level one tomorrow, we would be able to sing hymns from next Sunday, although behind our mass. However, we're still on level two, but please sing in your hearts the words of our closing hymn, all oh, for a thousand tongues to sing.
grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.